Welcome, everybody, to What's in Store, the show where we cover hot topics at the cross-section of retail and real estate. I'm Carly Iacono, and I'm joined by my co-host, Chris Ressa. Chris, great to see you. How have you been? I've been great. You? Love and life. Doing well. No complaints. You've been skiing a lot. I have been skiing almost every weekend in Vermont. It's been an adventure this year. Not a lot of snow. Where are you going skiing? Last weekend was Okemo, and it was negative one with 25 mile an hour winds and just a sheet of ice. I literally felt like I was in an Arctic survival show. And as I'm going down the mountain and this gale force winds, I'm like, why do I do this? What? what? I am nuts. Um, so I'm excited to be heading out west in a few weeks. Should be a lot better. So is that fun, like when you're on a sheet of ice you know, with gale force it's winds? It's fine fun. It's adrenaline inducing and adventurous fun. Maybe not so much last weekend. Yeah. I, Since I grew up wrestling in the winters, I never had time to go skiing. So I skied until I was about seven. And then I don't think I've been on a mountain since I was like seven years old. Wow. And I'm not really selling it today either. So <laughs> You're not maybe. selling it now. <laughs> yeah, I need to tell you all the good points and get you back out there. I'm going the other direction. Uh, in a couple weeks, we're going on vacation to St. Thomas. Oh, that sounds amazing right now. Yes. I wish I could swap out with you for a, a we, warm weekend. But I'll go out on a limb. There's not a, too many things that like I'm really scared of. But one of the things I'm not great with is heights. Okay. Literally, when we went on vacation, my wife and I, we went on a baby moon a few years ago to Palm Springs. They have this like monorail up the top of the mountain, and it's this like car that's like this, and it's on a cable, and it goes from like the bottom to the top of the mountain. So we went on, it looks fine, but it moves, right? It sways. It sways, and like I didn't do great with that. I literally fell to my knees and was holding on. My wife's like, Chris, Did she make fun of you, or was she up supportive? right now? Get up! You look ridiculous. <laughs> get she made up! Fun of you. Yes. Uh, we got to the top of the mountain, and I was like, "I'm walking down." And then the waiter was like, "It's gonna take like an entire day for you to get." This is a, it took you like 30 minutes on a monorail to get up. It's gonna take like a day to get down. So <clears throat> I say that because we're going to St. Thomas, and the house we rented is at the top of this mountain. The roads are pretty narrow, and they're like, sometimes a Jeep can get up it, sometimes it can't. And so I'm slightly concerned. Like Once I get there, I'm not leaving, I don't think, because going up and down, yeah, I'm going to, so we'll see how that goes. Well, we have a really interesting episode today. Uh, I think it's one that's going to be extremely relevant for all of our investor and landlord clients, and that is lease provisions that impact the value of your retail properties. Really tangible, meaty episode. And I'm excited. Me too. I think we should get going and jump in. Let's go. So we have seven different things we're going to cover today in no particular order. It's not like our, you know, best to, to worst here. Just seven things that you should consider if you own retail properties. So the first one and this is becoming more and more important as inflation continues to pick up, and that is caps on reimbursements from your tenants. Now, think of these like your nets, your taxes, your maintenance, your insurance. And and really, I think the easiest one to talk about is CAM caps, right? Caps on any of your common area maintenance. I'm seeing this, and I'm, I'm really interested to see how you're dealing with this with your tenants, Chris. I'm seeing this with new deals that are being inked where the tenants and single tenant are pushing back, saying we don't want unlimited uh, responsibility. We'll pay for common area maintenance up to X amount or X percentage over the base year on taxes, right? They're trying, the tenants are trying to put some limits in these leases, which obviously is a concern from an investor standpoint. So what are you seeing in terms of caps on reimbursements and how are you dealing with it in your portfolio? I would actually say I'm seeing this go the other direction a bit because I think in the shopping center space, caps on CAM specifically have been pretty prevalent for a long time. It's not a new thing that's grown. I would tell you, I think landlords are starting to push back on what those caps would be. A standard provision you would see in a shopping center lease is, you know, common air maintenance is estimated to be $2.50 and or the controllable cam won't go up by more than 5% a year. So 
what's controllable and what's not. That's there's no defined terms. What defines those terms is what's in the lease. Usually, uncontrollable will be something like snow plowing, right? And that'll be pulled out, and there's no cap on that. What I'm seeing is those caps are increasing, seven, ten percent, where they used to be standard five, because landlords are have the leverage to do that. I haven't seen them go away totally, but I've seen them expand. I think the one thing a lot of shopping center owners, let me take it back, not a lot, some shopping center owners are doing is going to fix cam. Hmm. We haven't done that. I think it's really interesting. We've done it on a couple of deals and we're testing it. I think if you do it right, you can win on fix cam. Um, obviously, you're betting against inflation. And fixed cam is when <clears throat> you're not actually reconciling the actuals it's just here's what the cam is and there's a fixed increase per year whether it happens or not i would say there's some landlords who are really going toward that and there's if you have scale there's some benefits right there's less accounting work to do there's less labor in actually managing it so there's some benefits in in that side of it in some respects i think there's opportunities to win on that because typically what will happen is whatever the year one cam is it's typically a number that is not the exact cam because you're in the middle of the year we don't that lease won't be signed till next year so you're making an estimate on what that cam will be to start the period well that estimate is has the opportunity to be higher than the actual and if the increases are based off that you could potentially beat inflation on fixed cam you could also lose Right. I've seen the cases where people lose. Um, <clears throat> so that that's happening. But as it relates back to just the basics. Hold on, I have a question on that. i got to jump yeah. in here. With the fixed increases annually, what percentages are you getting tenants five. agree to? It's five. five. So what I, would say, what I would say is we're not really focused on fixed CAM as an organization. Right. Um, we've only done it in a few instances. But that's the line, right? If you think inflation is going to be more than 5%, you're not going to do that. If you think it might be less, it's it's almost like the line in betting, right? That's the argument. I would argue that I think the line is less critical than the starting cam right. price. That's the most important piece, which is what is the starting price? So start ahead. Yeah, then then there. then you can then eventually, maybe in 40 years the line catches up to you, mm-hmm. but usually not in 10. Mm-hmm. So it depends on where you start. Like if if you if the estimate of CAM is like two fifty and you and the tenant agree, okay, the store's not going to open until next year. We'll we'll call CAM three dollars, and then we'll base five percent increases off that. Right. You could win, or at least not lose. You might not win because inflation's high, landscape costs are going up, other costs are going up, but you might not lose. And then I would say specifically, I'm not seeing any caps on taxes or insurance. That's not happening. Those are deal killers. So that's an unknown, though. Let's go back to the cam for just a second. You're saying you would take the potential upside, maybe, right, of doing the fixed cam if you start out ahead and have set increases instead of just doing a reconciliation where you know that your expenses are going to be covered. So you're almost you're taking something that is a known if you have all triple net leases, your cam is going to be covered on a pro rata share, and you're making it an unknown. Are you going to be above? Or are you going to be a below just for the chance of an upside? Potentially, yes. Interesting. Okay. Like I said, we're not really doing it, right. but I, I'm, I'm very. Uh, we we have a lot of discussions internally. Okay. Clearly, I've lost on it, <laughs> but I'm very open to the concept because I think you could end up winning. Right. So there's that chance. Yeah. Okay. So you're a gambling man. I got it. Okay. With thoughtful, you know, yeah. analysis behind it. Sure. We're not going crazy here. Right. Okay. Got it. Very interesting. So in the net lease space, it's a little bit different, right? Sure. Because these assets are designed to be passive with the tenant covering everything, taxes, maintenance, and insurance, usually in their entirety. So if we have a cap, it just changes the structure of the asset class. And the developers who have come to me and said, do you think this is a problem? This is what the tenant wants. My answer is always yes. Yes, this is a problem. You No caps. We want it fully reimbursed by the tenant. And we've got to get around this issue. But it's come up more uh, in the last six months than I have ever seen in the past. And I think that's because all of these expenses are rising so fast and the tenants are starting to push back and say, "Ah, actually, we we don't want that uncertainty of what these nets are going to look like in five years. So it's going to be a push and pull, I think, for the net lease space in in this part of the market cycle. Yeah, I haven't seen, at least on our freestanding deals that are structured like ground leases or like net leases, 
I haven't seen caps on cam be an issue yet. It's new. But, but the we'll new see. leases. We'll see. Yeah, the ones in place, they're, they're sure. not like that. So anyway, interesting, interesting topic for sure. Let's move on to the second one. Sure. The second provision that affects the value of your property and your leases is your guarantor and your tenant entity. So we, on the net lease side, we deal with this all the time, right? Just because you have a Wendy's does not mean it's a Wendy's corporate. So who is your franchisee if it's a franchise deal? And then what entity are they signing the lease in? Just because you have a 100-unit franchisee does not mean the entity on the lease has all 100 units backing that location. So really diving into what the entity is, what real estate they hold, and what that guarantor means is, is crucial. And I think a lot of the newer investors miss that nuance, right? Who's actually your entity on the lease? So I'm sure that you're going for the biggest guarantee, the you know the the biggest entity that you can with your tenants, because that would be the most security. But how does that conversation look in the shopping center space for you? It's one I'm. You could ask the leasing team. I'm pretty passionate about. I have you know we we make sure we have an appropriate entity on the lease often. And I think it could easily be overlooked because entities are like something LLC and right. it might, you, you might miss a letter and it's the, a different totally entity. Different. Mm-hmm. So I think the big thing to understand, I think, it, I think actually the, the franchisees are interesting. I think the, and, and that's easily understood because it's a franchisee, it's not the corporate entity. I think it's when you're signing the corporate entity but are you really signing the corporate right. entity? It's a sub entity. Right. So I think that's really the issue. Like they're like, oh, this is the entity that holds all our leases. And then you're like, okay, well, send me the financials. We don't run a separate financials for this because it's a it's a subsidiary and we're not required the other right. we're not required to do that. Okay. Well then how do I know that all the leases in there? What might happen is we might get like a we might have like in that scenario, you might have like a letter from the CFO that actually says like, okay. This is the net worth of this entity. This is how many stores are in it that's certified by the CFO of that company. But I'm already off on a tangent. It's like good luck getting that though. I don't know. Oh, uh, that. that happens. We get really? you get the yeah, because okay. because at the Or you're not making the deal, I guess, if you're not getting right, clarity because on the terms. You, yeah. you, know, you don't you know who you're doing. Who's signing the lease? Right, 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 right. So now uh, a lot of times, right, if you went, a lot of people what they'll do is they'll look at like they'll Google the stock of the company and they'll mm-hmm. see what like the stocks you know, the stock is in that corporate entity. It's rarely who's signing the lease. Right. So every once in a while, they might guarantee the lease, mm-hmm. but rare. It's usually some entity underneath it. Um, and and so I think really understanding, like, are, who you're getting, right? Who you're doing a deal with. It, the DBA is one thing, but are you getting the entity that really has this creditworthiness that you think it has right. is really critical, um, and sometimes you have to really unpack to try to find what that is. You know, the easiest way is, do we have financials for that entity? Right. Um, and, you know, sometimes I would say, I would say most times you can get the financials for that entity. Sometimes in scenarios where there's like, there might not actually be financials for that entity, like audited separate financials, then it's a little tricky. But yeah, we're very focused on it because... The, the entire creditworthiness is behind what signatures on that lease. And I think it's even more difficult if you're not the one initiating this deal. Let's say you're buying a shopping center and it's an existing lease. This isn't a new tenant and they don't have financials and it's not required under your lease. Now you're kind of asking a favor and what's their motivation for giving them to you if it hasn't been provided previously. So I think sure. that's, that's a big challenge. I was actually just reviewing a portfolio of deals uh, for a, a private REIT that I represent and they have, I won't say which tenant, but they have a handful of deals <coughs> from the same medical tenant. And when we looked at the signatures on the lease, every single one was different. It's a corporate entity, corporate guarantee, and every lease signature was different on their different locations. And we just had this conversation. Well, one's LLC this, one's Inc., one has a state name in the LLC, and we're like, what? what is but this? They were right? all, but, but so those are all different tenants, but there was the same it's guarantee? The same operator. It's the same corporate guarantee, but the, the lease is signed differently in each case. So, And we don't have financials for the sub-entity. So we're trying to figure out, is if, there a difference? But do you have a corporate guarantee? There's not a the... separate guarantee document, Oh, but it's written, this is with the parent company 
signed by Got this it. Event entity. So it's very unclear. And I, I think that makes a great point. But so these are not new deals. We'll have that. And a lot of national retailers will do that, which is they'll have some sub entity that might be like <clears throat> store A LLC in New York. Right. Is the tenant. But they will guarantee the lease, right? right? The corporate document. entity will guarantee the lease. Yeah. And what that's essentially doing is that tenant, that store ALLC, that tenant is responsible for the entirety of the lease. The guarantee is just the financial part of the lease, right? But the obligations of the 50-page lease are the tenant. That's not what they're guaranteeing. They're guaranteeing the financial consideration in that lease. Um, Important distinction. Yeah. Actually. Mm-hmm. All right, so know your lease, know your entities, and know what you really have, which is sometimes much harder than you realize. Right. So dig into that deeper. All right, our next consideration that affects the value of your property in terms of lease sections is termination rights. Now, this is a pretty varied topic, right? We can go through landlord termination, tenant termination rights, just basic term like a Starbucks where they have an early termination after a certain amount of time, or is it sales related, right? Sales benchmarks and terminations, co-terminancy. There's so many different ways this can show up. What are your biggest concerns with termination rights? And what do you think is unclear or something that you just would not put up with in a lease? So I think the first thing is to come back is is to say, all right, so every provision doesn't have a distinct remedy. And so when someone violates, and what the remedy is, is you rely on the default provision, either the tenant default or the landlord default. Usually both have termination rights after a period of time in every type of lease because those are controllable events by both parties. Mm -hmm. What has happened is, right, or, and typically in that default provision, what that really means is you're, if you're relying on that, you're going to court to sue the other party. And so to stop that on more common issues, what happened over time is certain provisions got remedies. And one of those remedies for certain provisions might be a termination. So... <clears throat> The, that's why you might be able to terminate for, you know, if there's a sales kick, but not for other reasons. Right. The other reasons are you rely on the default provision, and then if you can't resolve it through that, then you go to court. And to stop going to court over what both parties felt were more common, they ended up coming to remedies. So the first distinction is what provisions deserve a remedy and what should rely on the default provision? And, you know... I think landlords in general would try to rely on the default provision more and have less, you know, provisions with remedies. But m many leases now have remedies in leases. What happens if the, the tenancy of a property falls below a certain threshold right. of co-tenancy? What happens if sales are below a certain threshold, a sales, uh, a sales termination or kick out, right? So the determination of what provisions have remedies is is really the foundation of this, in my opinion, and what will you rely on the default provision for? Um, and that's a decision either th that you're going to make and or you're going to be positioned into by the other party. Right. So that's the first thing, I think. And how careful are you with those thresholds? Like if it's a sales kick out, are you really analyzing it and saying, okay, we, we believe that this is too low or too high? Are you pushing back on these different thresholds or are you just saying this should not be uh, a remedy at all? We're negotiating those thresholds Okay. Like really hard, I would tell you, right? Like if you want to understand the average store sales, what is their their store sales in that market? What are they projecting in that location? When is the measurement period is a big piece, mm. right? Because if you, let's say the threshold was a million dollars in sales and they have the right to terminate if their sales aren't a million dollars after year five. Well, what if years one, two, three, and four sales were $1.2 million and in year five, they were 900? Right. So what's the is measurement average, period? Is it one year? There's a whole. Look this is very. Down. This is very mm -hmm. negotiated. Right. By parties, uh, that one provision. Interesting. Okay, so this yeah. is another thing that we need to look closely at. Are all of these different termination rights? Any other ones you want to touch on? We touch on I sales, think, co terminancy. I, I think co tenancy and sales are are big ones. On the co tenancy piece, you know that typically. 
after the after there's a co-tenancy violation, there's usually a cure period. Right. Um, sales termination. They either hit the sales or they didn't. <clears throat> and, but those are the two big ones. I think. What if there's an exclusive violation? That's the other one. Okay. So if a tenant has a an exclusive, this is one like should it be in the default provision, should right. line default, or should there be a remedy? Um, you know, a remedy might be okay. <clears throat> we have a coffee shop. I'm not allowed to put in another coffee shop on the property. Right. If I do, then the existing coffee shop's rent goes to half for 12 months. After 12 months, they can either, it's what they call sunsets, they can either go back to full rent or terminate the lease. Right. <clears throat> the coffee shop probably doesn't love that provision, and they would probably, and they would say, well, now you can just make a business decision to violate my exclusive or not. It's not really an exclusive. Some call that actually a restrictive covenant, not an exclusive. Right. And so do we just rely on the default provision? If you do this, I can terminate or, you know, we're going to court and what should we do? And so that that's the other one is exclusive. <clears throat> Sales kicks, co-tenancy, those are big ones. Really, really uh, <clears throat> complex and just kind of shows how important these leases are and each section matters. It's not just the basic business terms. But sure. There's so much more to it. So the operations. that's another point. Like, are these legal terms or business terms? We talk about this all the time. Every company is different. I think so far the ones we've talked about, we would argue these are more business terms than legal. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. They're not being put forth on your initial tenant LOI, I'm sure, but they're quickly in that first draft. I, they are. They, you're putting them in the LOIs. Really, I, I mean, no, the, retail, the retailers okay. are putting them in the LOI. Got it. Okay. Uh, the, so far, what I've talked to, I would tell you for the top 100 public national retailers, this is in their LOIs. Because it's their boilerplate language and yeah. they already know where they're going to get to, so why not yeah. just put it out there in the LOI? Yeah. And then you're pushing back on this. Yeah. In the negotiations. For sure. Ah, oh, fun. Love it. Okay. Let's move on to the next provision, which is the right to go dark. Um, this is an interesting one because it obviously it affects your entire shopping center if you have a tenant go dark um, before the end of their lease, even if they continue paying their rent. So in what cases do you want to allow this and which are you not allowing a right to go dark provision? When is it in your favor to allow them to go dark, let's say, or is it ever? One of the people in our C-suite, uh, Basil Donnelly, he would tell you, Chris, the most important provision in the lease is that the tenant pays rent. Mm -hmm. And the second most prov important provision is they open and operate. So I don't know that you ever want them to go dark. Um, the For some major national companies that have big balance sheets, it's really tough to not allow them to go dark if they if they have an unprofitable business and they're losing money but they're going to stay and still pay you rent it's hard to not acquiesce on that provision uh and now i would tell you there are nuances to that i would tell you you have to open right which gets pushed back a lot for at times because what if something changes over the year that they don't want to, even though they might pay you rent? Right. But we would push back and say, you have to open, especially if I have to deliver. Right. If I have to deliver, then you have to open. Right. Right. Like you can't have the right to not open, but I have to deliver by a certain date. Right. Um, but going dark is, I, I think, is really hard to challenge. You can put, I think you could put timelines around it. Like you can't go, we've done that. Like you can't go dark for, the first five years. Okay. Uh, things like that. But like, I think you'd be hard pressed for some, if you took like the top five largest publicly traded retailers to not find the majority of their leases have go dark provisions. And are they agreeing to five years where uh, that's excluded? Where they, or is it, they want- I would want say most of them not. Flexibility all the time and that's your middle ground is yeah. five years. I'm not, I'm, I would say most of their leases, I bet, don't mm -hmm. know they're, private documents, most of them would say, you know, they can go dark unrestricted. Okay. <clears throat> now, there might be a penalty if they go dark. Right. And the landlord might have a remedy, right? The landlord, if they go dark, the landlord might have the right to recapture the space. Okay. That would make sense. Right. right. 
that might be an option. You say that makes sense. Sometimes they don't have the right to recapture the space because... No, but it would make sense from a landlord perspective yeah. to want that, right, yeah, right? Because exactly. you want a vibrant, viable center. You don't yeah. want a dark space, even if you're getting the rent hurts overall. Yeah. We looked at a Walgreens a handful of years ago in Staten Island, really high rent store, build to suit, beautiful. They never opened. And the seller came to me and he said, yeah, you know, they're paying rent. We have 18 years left. They've never opened. They're just going to stay. What can we sell this for? I mean, crazy rent per year or two. And they just uh, they just never opened and uh, never moved in and were honoring their lease obligations. Would Now, how did you sell it? We never took it to market, actually. No, nope, he decided what, to hold it because he didn't like the pricing. What, so what, what do you think the Delta it. in cap rates is that? Oh, absolutely tremendous. Uh, 300 basis points probably. Really? I think it's significant. I think it's significant. You think less? I don't know. I'm, I'm like thinking maybe you and I should buy it. Like, <laughs> like if they're going to pay the rent for them, I'm just kidding. Deal made but like, right here, right now. But I'm like. What's in store? First deal. Yeah. But 300 basis points. I think it's significant. Yeah. I think it's significant. But if you're the, if you're the when passive. Does Wal- in, you're well, the, when does Walgreens push back on that? Like right now they're paying all their rents and their nets and everything. I mean, they have a guarantee, but at what point. But, but I guess the, this is the, I understand it from. A landlord of multi-tenant shopping centers. Right. But if you're passive income, you're you're some doctor in Minnesota. You're passive income. You're buying, for lack of a better word, you're buying an income stream backed by cr- some sort of credit instrument. But you know they're not uh, going to exercise their options because they're already not open, right? But and how long how do you re- was it? Yeah, I think it was 18 years when I looked at it. It's probably 15 years I now. I mean, are they not? Are they and not? Then w- how do you replace that rent? The rent was absurd. So <clears throat> so you know that you have a finite investment period and a rent that is significantly above market. So what do you do with that space in 15 years? You need a plan for the next step because you already know they're not going to stay. So I, I have two points to that. One is at the end of 18 years, I would hope that your investment – or returns you have made them in 18 years right so you've recapped your principal right yeah i i would think what i don't know what it depends on what your metrics are right but that's the first piece like if you're buying something where like in 18 years you're not winning that's a tough investment i don't know much money out there that's chasing things that aren't returning capitally in 18 years number two i'd argue that you don't know if they're exercising an option in 18 years, whether they're open or not. Mm. So contrarian perspective. Option, okay. option, options are just that options. They're a hundred percent tenant favored. They do nothing for a landlord. Right. And it, it, because they have an option, like to me, that doesn't have any, that doesn't mean they're staying open. Right. Cause if you're saying it's such high rent, if they were staying there, why would they pop it? Why would they pop that option if it was such high rent? Well, that's what I'm saying. They're, I don't think they're going to. Well, they're not going because they're clo- They're dark. Right, right. But if, even if they were open, right. someone would buy that for 300 basis points less on the hope and a prayer that they're going to pop that option? Well, the thought that they're performing well. They wanted to be there. They've got a viable store. It's okay. I will send it to you this afternoon. <laughs> we will have a deal made by 5 p.m. But you that's see my point? Day. You see my yeah. point? Like in 18, year, 18 years... It, we could all pretend so we different. know. I got we, who it. knows it's what's going to happen? Who, yeah. Exactly. Who knows what's going to happen in eighteen years? Okay, I like it. So maybe go dark uh, has some other hidden benefits but I, here. But but to your point, if it's three hundred basis points, that's that's wild. That's a big difference. It's a big difference. Yeah, I really think it's a big. It's a huge difference in sentiment and the long term viability of the site. I think it's a tremendous difference, more than you do. Interesting. Let's move I, on. I think I think it matters to the real estate. Don't get me wrong, but I don't know that it's. I, I didn't know that was three hundred base points. I was just. I just didn't know. You could buy it for a less spread. You could. There will be that chance. All right. Let's move on to assignment and subletting language. Two more terms that really can change the whole characteristic of your investment if you're not careful with these provisions. So, when we're looking at. Uh, single tenant, it's very clear that you want some sort of limitation on who, let's say it's a franchise fast food deal. 
you really want some limitation on who that can be assigned to so you preserve the security behind your guarantee, right? You don't want to go from a 150 unit operator down to a one unit operator with a personal guarantee, right? That would be a degradation in the quality of your guarantee. So you want to make sure that in the assignment provisions, there's some benchmark, right? Subletting, similar, uh, very different, right? You may still preserve the guarantee, but you don't want it to be a completely different use of something that you didn't want to own in the first place. So we try to look for leases that have pretty strict landlord favorable language, but on the tenant side, of course, they need the flexibility. They want the flexibility. They have to be able to sell their business at times and make business decisions, sell groups of locations off. So there has to be assignment uh, language specifically. And then if they, maybe they don't need all the square footage, they need the subletting um, language, right? Especially as store sizes grow and shrink and change. They want that flexibility. So how are you coming to middle ground with tenants on these two provisions? What's working for you? I think at, I think sublease is a lot more prevalent in the office space world, especially right now. Mm. There's a lot of people trying to sublease. Yeah, for sure. There's obviously subleasing in retail. I would say it's not as much as assignments. So I think the general position of landlords in retail is you can sublease, but you, you, this is about retailing and we don't want you to profit off our real estate. Right. I think that's the, the, the general consensus. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the real estate profit should be ours. You make the retailing profit. So hold on. On that point then, would you look to share the delta in the rent? What if they sure. sublease it for more? Okay. 100%. So you get a, per, a part of that. Yeah. 100%. The amount of subleases for, versus the amount of tenants in our portfolio, it has to be less than half a percent one like it's there's not a lot of subleasing going on okay um but assignments are very prevalent like that's weekly um and they're more prevalent on the local tenant side Mm -hmm. right someone opens up a pizza shop and they do great and they want to retire and they got to sell their business right right so i'd be less concerned about that than going from a large, almost corporate entity to a small entity. I think that changes your deal. But a local operator to a different local operator, maybe you look for some sort of financial metrics or net worth of the operator. Maybe you don't. I don't know. That, yeah, that we do. Feels there, there's, there's parameters. Be equal. Yeah. So there's usually two things. There's usually permitted transfers. Mm-hmm. And then those are the transfers that a tenant can assign the lease without landlord's consent. Mm-hmm. And then there's transfers that they have to consent. Typically, a permitted transfer would be like if someone went and bought all the stock of Starbucks, right? Right. That no do? one landlord can stop that right, entire transaction, course. right? So yeah. that that's a permitted transfer. Um, but if they want to just assign their lease, like you know, they have you have a parent as a guarantor. And they, this retail company has like five different chains. Mm-hmm. Well, and they decide to sell one of those chains. Well, um, typically what would happen, I think the first thing is most of our leases would say, you can do that, but you're still staying on as the guarantor. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> we have a few spaces where when you saw, the, if you saw the DBA, you would think that was the tenant, but that's that that lease was assigned to them, um, and the guarantor is the previous tenant. Got it. Um, is who there might, a burn off of that? When the lease expires. Okay, not before. Typically, it's when the lease. Well, does expires. it go through the options too? Mm, that typically the lease is typically I would say <clears throat> yes, but then that would mean that tenant wouldn't exercise their option. Right. Right. So they would say, I'm not exercising, work a direct deal. We want a new lease with it, right. Well, no, they, we want, we want we you to work a new lease that. with this tenant. Right, makes sense. I think my biggest concern of that is like all the spinoffs for the major companies, right? Like we were seeing in the COVID time, there was a lot of retail brands separating out their e-commerce into two separate businesses and trying to create separate entities Mm -hmm. and siphon them off and not being cohesive. This goes back to your tenant and guarantor. Uh, To me, the assignment provision, right? Like, because if some big brand sells all their stores of one of their retail chains, 
well, do you still have the big brand on the lease or not? Right. Right. I, this was a big thing when in the Asina Dress Barn. Hmm. Okay. So Dress Barn went to, Dress Barn like announced before Vegas ICSC a few years ago that they were filing bankruptcy. But Dress Barn was a sub brand, was a, was a brand owned by Asina, right? Who owned Ann Taylor at the time, right. Lane Bryant, Fashion Bug at the time. And so, you know, we did some homework and rarely did a parent put a sub in retail into bankruptcy. So they went to Vegas and they said they were filing bankruptcy. Hmm. And then we made all these deals. They made all these deals with these landlords to terminate leases by year end. We didn't terminate them. Uh, And so we said file. And time went on. And they, and they and they didn't and they, and it took a while before they ended up filing, and I'm I'm trying to even remember if they actually filed or they just had like an orderly liquidation of all their stores. But hmm. the problem was if they didn't pay you rent, no one had a Cena. Very few leases. I say no one. Very few leases had a Cena. But you know, if you went to court, it was like okay. Dress Barn owes you X. There's a real entity behind Dress Barn. How much money does Dress Barn actually have? But you couldn't pierce that you and go up to a scene because you didn't have that. Right. So I think... What a protection for the retailer then to spin it off like that into those different entities and not have them on the lease. But from a landlord perspective, that's definitely high risk. I mean, but they would tell you like... That was like a thousand store chain. Right. So it's better than most of your leases. Right. Right? That's what most would say. Until it's not because business goes bad. Spin it off, yeah. Right? Or, 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 right. So, but I, I think the spinoff is interesting right now that whether it's the e-commerce or, or some other spinoff that they want to do, but um, yeah. All right, another thing to pay close attention yeah, to. Yeah, I think the assignment provision is really, yeah, right now is getting negotiated more than it has in the past because mm-hmm. <clears throat> retailers want flexibility and landlords want, want to make security. sure. I, I'm, I, of we're doing a deal with you. Right. Right? We don't know who the next person is. We're spending the TI, the landlord work, exactly, on you. Exactly, because in your business, in your, and business. your entity, and, and not the next one. So, yeah. yeah. It's always flexibility versus security. That's the the fight and the balance. All right, we have two more. The next one is environmental indemnification. Now, this gets a little legal, right, on the the provisions and how it's written and what the protections are. So we're going to go kind of quickly, but I do think it's important to bring up. And this is really uh, more relevant depending on the use, right? If you have a a gas station, obviously there's going to be more concerns over time than if you have a clothing store. So – how strong this indemnification language is, or even if it's in your lease at all, I think does really kind of connect to what type of lease uh, or what type of use that you're talking about. So we've seen some language, especially in the gas station space, that's very strong, that the operator has complete obligation for anything during their period of operation, and some even looking backwards, right? They're taking over the site, they're clean, and they're certifying to the next person that at this point, everything is clean. So you're basically protected as a landlord from everything from that point back. Um, Some language is not so strong, right? And there's a little more ambiguity about who's responsible for what over time. So aside from gas stations, which is an obvious one, where else are you really, maybe some dry cleaners, you know, some other higher risk uses from a, a use perspective, how are you looking at environmental indemnification? When does this really become a discussion point in your uh, your office i mean you took the all the uses out dry cleaner and Go ahead. We want to make you think gas. what's the next hard uh, so i i think so i'm gonna car before washes I, wait car washes, sure. i mean i can come up with more before i before i answer that are you seeing this provision change value at a property i'm seeing it kill deals kill deals mm-hmm. so it's not that we're pricing it in okay Although if we have really strong indemnification language, we will usually bring that up in the, you know, in the marketing if we can in some positive way, but that's less frequent. Usually it's deep into the deal, even if it's clean (coughs) or maybe there were some historic wrecks, but everything's fine now. And then there's no indemnification moving forward. It depends on the risk profile of the buyer, but I've seen that kill deals. 
Got it. Um, I would say most of the non-invasive uses, this is a provision that gets is pretty amicable between parties in the lease. Um, the attorneys usually can get through this. I think really um, it has to do, the biggest thing, especially in redevelopments, is, you know, uh, is asbestos, right? Mm -hmm. Is there asbestos in the space? How are you going to handle that? Right. Whose responsibility is that all that gets dealt with? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's different than ground-up development, which is usually... You know, we're talking about what's in the ground versus what's in the walls. Right. Uh, the older the property, the more common asbestos. But as we, you know, this is, asbestos will start at some point to be less and less because as properties get redeveloped, it gets right. taken out, it's been removed, yeah. but it comes up still. I'm actually looking at a, a property now with asbestos concerns and we're getting quotes on how to remediate it and what does this look sure. like moving forward and what's the I mean, we do that like all it. the time, so yeah, uh, we have to remediate all the time. Um, it's tricky. But... And what does remediation mean right. um, in that marketplace? So yeah, anyway. yeah. Okay, so n maybe not such a, a sticky or controversial provision unless you have a use that would demand yes further discussion. Okay, great. Let's move on to our last point, which is right of first refusals or right of first offer. Slightly different in the leases. We see these all the time on single tenant deals, especially fast food deals. You know, certain tenants kind of demand them more than others. Um, from my perspective, it's not been an issue if it's on the shorter side, 15 days, 21 days. When it gets to be 30 days or longer, really tough, really tough because you're now holding up that buyer in an unknown situation, especially if it's a 1031 exchange buyer. They have set timelines. They've got to ID. They need to know if this rover is going to go forward or not. Um, so it does become an issue for the deal process if you get on the longer side. Shorter ones we're very used to dealing with. What's your, do you offer, now on the, I would say on the shopping center side, it's, it's probably completely different. Your small shop space, they're not going to have a rofer on the entire center, right? Very few leases have rofers. Yeah. Uh, even on our, you know, freestanding parcels where we want to flip them out, where, or even if we don't want to sell them, we have... I don't remember the last deal where we get, where we gave a rofer to a tenant. Uh, there's not one coming to mind. Um, they, I, I think they're really, uh, really tough for a landlord to swallow. So, there it's been very few and far between where we've given them. Um, what the rofer typically would look like. What we see a lot is maybe a tenant wants the right of first refusal to lease the space next door. Mm, right. That happens. That, that happens. Right. Um, but the problem with the rofer on a sale, right, is, to me, is less about delaying the existing buyer, albeit that's a problem. But it's more about what if they exercise the rofer and then they don't close? No, it's just like any other buyer, in my mm. opinion. What's the so, difference? So, but to me, if they, the difference being is, that they killed your one deal. It's one right. thing to delay the deal. Right. It's another thing to actually, like, I, you can work within a delay. Right. Right? It's 21 days. It's 30 days. This is not great. But, like, I could finesse this and figure it out. But it's one thing. You had a live person who was going to close, and then that died for a deal that didn't. That's my biggest challenge with it. There's more, but that's my biggest because, you know, that is, they really have a lot of leverage at that point, especially if you need to sell right? and they know you need to sell and then they retrade you and you can't go back to your original buyer. It becomes a timing and perspective, right? Do you want to start the marketing process again? Do now you another you're buyer? stuck. Do you work with that it's buyer? really tough. But that could be any buyer tying up a deal, right? To me, it's just another buyer at that point. And there are some advantages to selling to the tenant because they already know the property. They, you know, it's less due diligence usually. But in that case, yeah, they could tie it up. They could mess up your other deal, but that could be any buyer also. Yeah, but you're forced into that one. Right. That's you're the difference. You're forced into working with them. Yeah. The price is you, right. you didn't have you didn't have you didn't have a choice in, right. like you did the other buyer. I will say I have seen this come up very few times where the tenant does exercise. It's I know. That. Extremely rare. It's every buyer's concern if there is a rofer, like, oh my goodness, I'm going to get tied into this deal. I'm going to be waiting, and then they're going to exercise. I'm going to lose the deal. Then what? 
it is such a small percentage of tenants that exercise row first because they just they really don't want to own the real estate in most cases. It doesn't make financial sense. A um, few exceptions. We did do a Duncan uh, maybe a year ago where they exercised the rofer. It was one of the fastest, easiest deals we've ever done. Duncan Corporate bought it. We closed in like two and a half weeks and it was done. And I, wow. And they paid the market price that we had gotten the other That's accepted offer on. They didn't play around. So they, they wanted to own it. Basically the lowest price. Yeah. And they were happy about it. But that's one of the absolute exceptions. And I think it's... Because it's, that's a genuine exception, right? The, right? Clearly what that meant was they originally wanted to own it. Right. The landlord wouldn't owned, sell it. Wouldn't sell it, it leased it. Yeah, lease so they it. said, okay, fine. If you ever yeah. want to sell it, I want to bite at the apple. Right. That's like, it seems like so cordial and genuine when we're talking about it like this, it just <laughs> rarely happens that way. Extremely but so rare. when they went yeah. to market, they said, yeah, I've wanted to buy this since right. I've been a tenant for the last five years. I'll buy it from you. Right. And there you go. And then, and then you sold it in two weeks. And that is like a 1% chance. Yeah. So really great when deals like that happen. But I think the takeaway here is limit the row for timeline if you have to give it as part of your negotiation, right? Give the tenant as little time as possible. And in most cases, it's really not as big of a deal in the deal process that everyone worries it is. But so this is one, I don't know if it, uh, and you could tell me how much it impacts value, but I would say it impacts liquidity in the market because there are definitely buyers who won't pursue a deal if they know the tenant has a row for Timeline. I have not gotten pushback on 15 days, even 21 days. Okay. When you start hitting 30 days, it, it's a problem. Yeah. So if it's short, I think you can get around it. Right, you start the process as early as possible. The longer it, it goes, then yes, it can be a deal killer. Got it. Okay. Keep them short if you got to give them. That's Keep the them short. that's the uh, the message here. All right. We covered so much good content today. We really appreciate everyone tuning in to our lease provisions that affect the value of your retail properties. As always, feel free to reach out to Chris or I with any follow up questions or thoughts. We love to hear from you. And that was What's in Store with Carly and Chris. We can't wait to see you all again very soon. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you.